if you go all the way back to uh, 1987, that was when Bath was inscribed on the World Heritage List. Now, that's important for Bath for many reasons, but I need to go back a little bit further than that to 1972, when UNESCO was formed, uh, and it was formed uh, in order to um, look after items of outstanding universal value which are around the world and it, that could be anything from the Great Wall of China to um, the uh, pyramids in Giza to all manner of different areas around the world both made man-made like Stonehenge or, or uh, simply uh, natural like uh, waterfalls and things of that nature. Now that sounds great but the idea is to look out to identify them, look after them and hand them on to the next generation for their future protection. And it wasn't until 1984 that UNESCO actually started to uh, inscribe some of these world-known artifacts onto their list and indeed the first one uh, was the Galapagos Islands, so a very natural uh, existence. Uh, and then it, the next one actually um, was the line of the equator, going passing through the center of Quito, uh, the, the center in Ecuador. Now, bringing all that back to Bath, when Bath was inscribed in 1987, just three years after um, we started to uh, have World Heritage Sites in the UK. Um, it was in fact the sixth World Heritage Site to be inscribed in the same year as uh, Westminster Abbey and the year before the Tower of London. Now that gives you some idea of, of the uh, reverence with which it's being held in World Heritage terms for our fantastic city. Barry, under uh, normal circumstances, without a pandemic, that World Heritage status is a bonus for Bath. It gives it kudos. No doubt it encourages even more tourists to come here. But who is charged in looking after that status, in looking after the things in Bath that gave it that status? In short, it's the council but the council's responsibility comes from the UK government and the UK government's responsibility comes directly from UNESCO. Now, um, if you think about it, you're quite right about the, the tourism aspects. That responsibility needs to be managed because before the pandemic, our tourist numbers in Bath were up to 6.25 million people a year. And if you think of that compared to the 65,000 people in, in the city of Bath who are actually responsible for paying council tax, uh, that looks like a ratio of 97 visitors for every single resident wow. of the city. Wow. Now, if you think about those 97 people actually walking around, eroding the public realm, walking on our grass areas, um, you know, the whole of the public realm, bench seating, street lighting, all of that kind of stuff uh, has to be funded by the council. Now it would have to be funded by the council whether it was a World Heritage Site or not. And the direct next line down below the council is the World Heritage Advisory Board, which is the voluntary body that I chair. Uh, and I've been chairing it for just over three years now. Um, and we have uh, some uh, 19 organizations represented by about 25 people in total and that's everything from the UK government down through the National Trust um, down to English Heritage, uh, Historic England, down to more local like Bath Preservation Trust, resident um, FOBRA, the Residents Association, um, tourism bodies here, um, the Bath Beard, a whole range of different organizations with an interest in preserving our world heritage. Now you've I mean, obviously, just, sorry, I was just going to say you, you've got limited funds to play with and I suppose in, in current circumstances even more limited funds to play with. But 
what are the sort of projects your group gets involved in? Well, the, the board itself, the advisory board, sits over uh, the top of uh, a couple of different working groups. And one of those working groups is, is the World Heritage Enhancement Fund for projects here in Bath. And we have been doing, uh, for the last nine or ten years, uh, been funded by the council um, to the tune of uh, £25,000 a year. And the Preservation Trust put in £5,000 a year. Now, unfortunately, of course, this financial year, we're not receiving any money from the council or from the Preservation Trust for very understandable reasons. But the sort of projects we've worked on, one of them, um, if you think about the street signs in Bath, they're all at first floor level. Not everybody will have noticed that, but some people will certainly have noticed it and wondered why all the street signs in Bath are at, at uh, first floor level. And there are various tales about why that should be. And one of them, which is the one that I like, is that if you were coming to Bath in the 18th century, you probably were wealthy enough to arrive in your own carriage or to come on a stagecoach. And it's not you that needs to know the street that you're in in order to direct the carriage and the horses, but the guys who are sitting on top who actually need to look at the names of the streets. And we've now restored 52 of those uh, over the past nine or 10 years. And indeed, we were very fortunate last year to win a national award from the Georgian Society uh, for that work. Um, it's, it's, it's transformed the signage in the center of Bath, and we want to continue doing that. Another project we're currently working on is Walcott Steps. Many people will know of Walcott Steps. They run uh, from the Paragon down to uh, Walcott Street. Uh, and they have been um, a very difficult area for uh, several years, not least because people believe that um, at night it becomes a drug exchange because the lighting is so poor. Um, and if you walk down there today, you'll see chunks of graffiti and other stuff. And I know, Richard, you're very anti-graffiti from listening to your uh, videos every day. But, you know, we've, we've started on that project. We have tidied up the entrance from the Paragon. Uh, we've started the repainting work of the bollards and, and some of the hand railing. And then down, further down, we're tidying up and repointing the steps, putting up uh, pigeon netting, putting back period lighting and that kind of stuff. Now that's about a £10,000 project, which we're doing over several years. That's, that's a very positive and, and visual and subtle way of, of caring for Bath. Barry, I don't know whether there is any money left in the kitty, but a little birdie told me that you were showing some interest uh, in repairing the damage that the obelisk in Queen Square's received. I don't know whether it's erosion or somebody's accidentally kicked the corner of it, uh, but it's missing a bit of limestone. Yep, indeed it is. And that's a real great shame because the, the obelisk uh, in Queen Square uh, was put up in 1738 by John Wood the Elder. Uh, and it, it was funded by a collection organized by uh, Richard Nash or Bo Nash here in the city. Um, it's a fantastic obelisk. If you've ever been up close, you'll have a chance to read the inscription. Or if you look at the signage uh, around Queen Square, that also refers to the inscription. Now, yes, indeed we are. We've commissioned the work to repair those, uh, that stonework at the foundation level. But you might be interested to know that when it was first erected in 1738, it stood on a little island in the centre of the square. And uh, the uh, stonework goes down uh, around three metres, so around 10 feet into the ground uh, to give it the stability. And when it was first uh, erected, it was some three metres higher than it is today. So it's now around 15 uh, metres high. That's around 45 to 50 feet if you know, doing the conversion. But it was another 10 feet higher than that. But in 1815, it was struck by lightning and the top was damaged. And it, it was then, uh, the top was flattened off to a, a flatter shape, which has protected it uh, ever since. 
it, it's our own little Washington monument. And uh, somebody actually emailed me to say it's lit up again at night. I hadn't realized that the lighting wasn't working. No, uh, that's the work of the council. That, that's not, uh, I, I can take no credit for that. It's a nice thing to do, um, but it is indeed uh, done by the council who are, are very supportive of World Heritage in whatever way they can help us. Um, and doing that with the, found, with the obelisk is fantastic. The one thing it, it, you might not know, unless you've read the signage particularly, is that the obelisk actually and Queen Square itself uh, used to be owned by all the frontages to the square, all the different houses and offices, the, the buildings and the, the hotel. Um, but in 1947, um, they wanted to uh, donate the, the square to the citizens of Bath, but actually it turned out to be far too complex. And so uh, by agreement with the frontages of the day, uh, the council uh, agreed to take over as representative owners of the square. And so in order to do the repair, we have had to get obviously the council's support and indeed the council are putting in some money to help pay uh, for a, about a third of the cost of the repair, which well, is fantastic. Yeah, that's a very complicated arrangement, but it's good to know it's being repaired. Now, the other thing that I've been uh, going on about, and well, I've been going on about it for several years, is the uh, the poor old fountain in, in Laura Place. I, I don't know whether your group has uh, taken a look at it. I've been told that Baines have commissioned a survey. That doesn't mean they're going to repair it. So I think they just want to know how much it's going to cost to repair. Uh, might you be able to help? We would love to help. Indeed, we were down there last week. Um, the fund administrator, um, Ainsley Enston, was down there taking some photographs just last week because we, we would like... It, it, it's such a pity, isn't it? You come across Pulteney Bridge and when you get close to the Laura Fountain, it just looks so poor. And I fully understand why you've been banging on about it for the last couple of years. And I agree with you that it would be great to uh, respect water uh, in our wonderful city. But actually, it looks to me that as though the, the repairs will be beyond the cost of, of the fund that I chair um, in today's circumstances. The damage is really poor. Um, it's in a very poor condition structurally. And I suspect that even if it was to be repaired as a fountain, it wouldn't be very long before a fairy liquid was pointed, was squirted into the water that that gums up the works over time uh, it looks you might argue it looks great fun when it's first done but of course it, it isn't really and it's causing untold damage and once you get the the frost into the cracks that appear in the structure the frost pushes those cracks further apart uh, and the water is going to leak away and the damage gets greater so uh, i think it would be an interesting idea to uh, think about whether it would make more sense for it to be uh, an attractive flower bed in the centre of what is in effect becomes a little roundabout. You are not the first person to suggest that and it does seem to be uh, economically speaking um, uh, the easy option or the better option let's say and to think that once upon a time they were going to put up a Nelson's column on that site so I have read, and it's obviously far too late for that to be done now. Barry, I'm grateful for your time this morning. Could I just ask you, while we're talking about projects, and this is one that you're not funding, I know, but um, Baines is involved in establishing a World Heritage Centre. Uh, it's the Archway Project, part of the old laundry, being turned uh, into a public space where people can actually go in and see how and why Bath uh, was inscribed and given world heritage status. I, I think that was one of the conditions laid down way back in 1987, wasn't it, that they should have such a centre. Is it still on course, have you heard, for completion uh, next year? Yes, it is. The Archway project is a tremendous project because not only will it have a world heritage centre, but also, of course, it's, it's really providing some fantastic learning spaces, both classroom spaces and practical spaces down 
underneath uh, the back of the Roman baths uh, for uh, school children and adult groups uh, together. Um, so it's a fantastic project. Stephen Bird is looking after the project in overall terms uh, for the council. Uh, and Tony Crouch, uh, the World Heritage Manager, has been leading the charge with regard to the uh, World Heritage Centre, which is going to be on the ground floor on the corner of Swallow Street. Uh, and if people um, remember, before the hoardings went up underneath the arch that used to take the water uh, to the, the laundry and the pipes hidden in the archway, there were, used to be a shop on that corner which sold uh, leather goods, leather jackets, coats and, and uh, items. Um, and it is that corner shop which is now being transformed into the World Heritage Center. Um, it's going to be staffed, it's going to uh, encourage people not only to learn a bit about the history and why we're a World Heritage Site. Uh, you know, we have six items of outstanding universal value, which makes us almost unique in World Heritage terms. I mean, it's very hard to be absolutely unique, but every World Heritage Site around the world, and there are 1,121 of them, has to have at least one aspect of outstanding universal value. Some have two, a few have three, and Bath has six, which is just fantastic. So they will be showcased, um, and we are working on a range of uh, walks from the World Heritage Centre out into the countryside so that people can see Bath looking down on it or exploring some of the countryside out to Prior Park, up to Alexandra Park, and that kind of stuff. Might that be open uh, in time for? A, a hoped for deluge of tourists next summer when this dreadful pandemic uh, is slightly more behind us? Well, we hope that the World Heritage Centre itself will be open somewhere between March and May 2021. So six months time, it should, it should be open. Um, obviously, all construction projects are taking longer uh, during the pandemic, um, there's not much one can do about that. But the good thing is the work has continued uh, through the lockdowns uh, in as much as it can. So hopefully we shall be there and we'll look forward to seeing you at the opening ceremony. <laughs> Barry, thank you for your time this morning. Pleasure.